be in, in psychiatry in uh, you know the 40s and the 50s and the 60s it you know kind of began you know the whole uh, uh, you know field of biological psychiatry you know psychopharmacology uh, you know it was uh, completely amazing that small small you know doses of LSD you know could produce you know such intense uh, you know psychological responses in people you know so that got people interested in serotonin and brain receptors and all kinds of things you know thorazine came out um, at around the same time, you know, serotonin was discovered at the around, you know, uh, you know, the same time, you know. So LSD, uh, you know, was pivotal in you know the development of biological psychiatry and psychopharmacology. Um, and you know, after these drugs got abused or abusable, you know, the, um, you know, the government clamped down on their study too. I was about to ask you what uh, what kind of rigorous uh, approval process did the FDA and DEA put you through? <laughs> Uh, just so you could have these studies. Oh, you know, it was pretty intense. Um, yeah, I had to work, you know, f- you know, fairly much, you know, full time for two years to get, you know, the permits for my DMT study. You know, and you know that was because it had been so long, and you know the rules and the regulations had changed, and all of the you know managers at FDA and you know DEA had changed over the last you know uh, twenty years or so. You know, so um, I was interested in, you know, resuming, uh, you know, uh, studies in, you know, psychiatry in an above board, uh, you know, honorable way. Um, and, you know, despite, uh, you know, the fact that human studies had stopped in, uh, you know, the early 1970s, animal studies had continued. And, uh, you know, there was quite a you know, lot of new information that had been accumulated over those 20 years about, you know, the receptors in the brain that res- are responsible, you know, for how psychedelics work. You know, the, uh, you know, the kinds of, uh, you know, biological and, and, you know, behavioral responses, you know, that these drugs elicit. Um, you know, uh, um, so ostensibly I was interested in, you know, confirming or refuting um, in, uh, in uh, the human, uh, you know, some of the animal data that had, you know, come out over the last, you know, 20 years. You know, like, for example, does, you know, do concentrations of endorphin go up after you give DMT to, uh, you know, to a human as, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, um, as had, uh, uh, you know, been discovered in, you know, lower animals. Um, and, uh, I was also interested in extremely carefully, you know, characterizing, you know, the psychological um, effects of DMT. You know, uh, the older rating scales and you know, psychological studies of these compounds all kind of emph- emph- all kind of emphasized, you know, the psychotic, you know, like qualities of the effect, or you know, um, you know, the disturbing qualities. The schizoid, the schizoid type of stuff. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. You know. So uh, you know, some people actually, you know, called compounds like the MT schizotoxins or you know psychotomimetic drugs. You know, they you know kind of mimic psychosis. And you know, people don't you know take these drugs for that reason. They you know take them because of their psychedelic effects. Um, and uh, you know, so I was interested in you know characterizing, you know, the you know the more interesting um, effects. You know, the ones that are more uh, you know sought after and pleasurable. You know, so I developed a you know new rating scale, which was more objective and you know and kind of neutral um, in tone, you know to you know to characterize and to quantify the responses, you know the psychological responses, you know to DMT as well. And how long did the study last? Um, did you have to get reapproved every year uh, in order to continue? In uh, terms of getting you know the initial DMT study off the ground, that took. Um, a couple of years of legwork, you know, and um, I ran about three or you know four DMT studies. Um, after every study was completed, I uh, you know needed you know to turn in my report. You know, the government required progress reports every year if the studies weren't completed. You know, by that time, um, you know, but after I got the studies um, off the ground with DMT. Um, I also uh, started to, you know, do some studies giving people psilocybin. And, you know, that was, uh, you know, quite a bit easier in terms of, you know, the regulatory and the approval process. That only took, you know, six months or so to get, um, you know, all of, uh, you know, the permits in order. And, you know, we started doing some, you know, dose, you know, finding work with, uh, with you know, psilocybin. And, you know, so after that, I actually uh, um, uh, applied, you know, for a study giving LSD to people. And 
you know, that only took like three months to get their permits, you know, for LSD. So it, you know, was easier um, each time because the government and I had kind of worked out um, a routine for getting uh, human studies um, articulated and approved and off the drawing board. So it, you know, became easier every time. That brings me to an, another question uh, that wasn't, that's not on the list, but um why why was the government so opposed to using DMT versus LSD? Why did they think that LSD was somehow better or or easier to approve? Oh, uh, you know, I think um it you know that it took, you know, 2 years to get the DMT work, you know, going because it was the first study of any kind with these drugs of any sort in humans in the US in 20 years. Um, so I actually, you know, began with DMT because it was a relatively obscure drug, and it, you know, didn't, you know, carry the same kind of, you know, baggage as LSD. Stigma. Yeah, yeah, the same kind of stigma. Yeah, you know, so I think if I had, you know, begun with an LSD study, it, you know, would have been a lot more complicated, actually. Um, I was interested in, you know, DMT, uh, you know, because it, you know, was um, off the radar at the time. Um, and wouldn't, you know, kind of, you know, draw the same kind of scrutiny as an LSD study. And you ran, you ran into a lot of, a lot of opposition, didn't you, whenever you first, uh, tried to associate, uh, DMT with, or, or the pineal gland, was it the pineal gland with, um, psychedelic experiences? Oh, well, you know, the whole pineal story is, you know, kind of an interesting one. It's, you know, kind of bit me on the ass, you know, more than once, this whole pineal thing. I, you know, I was interested in the pineal gland, you know, because it's got an esoteric history over the millennia. It's a, you know, third eye in lower animals. It, you know, has got uh, a, you know, long, illustrious, you know, es- um, esoteric, you know, kind of history. You know, Descartes believed it was, you know, the seat of the soul and it was the organ in the brain through which God communicated with us. And, you know, there are all kinds of interesting compounds and enzymes and components in the pineal gland. You know, so I speculated that there could be psychedelic, you know, compounds in the pineal gland. Um, I'm even wondered if, you know, perhaps melatonin has some psychedelic effects. You know, so I started a study with melatonin in humans at the University of New Mexico in uh, the mid-1980s. And, you know, we gave a lot of melatonin to lots of people. We suppressed melatonin. We gave small, medium, big doses. Um, And, you know, I was, you know, kind of hoping that, you know, melatonin would have, you know, some psychedelic properties. But it just made people sleepy, right? Yeah, it was just, you know, kind of sedating. Even, you know, when we accidentally overdosed, you know, somebody one time, um, he just became drowsy. Um, You know, that was about it. And so I kind of turned my attention away, from the, you know, from the pineal and, you know, any kind of putative, uh, you know, psychedelics, you know, that could exist there and went straight into the DMT work. You know, in, uh, you know, the DMT book, I, I speculate about, you know, the pineal making DMT and, you know, being released at, you know, particular, uh, you know, points in time. But um, it still is a hypothesis. Um, it isn't okay. true. It's not fact. It's not data. Uh, You know, I'm collaborating with a group at LSU right now, um, which has developed a extremely, you know, sensitive way to measure DMT in, you know, tissues and fluids. You know, so we're going to be, you know, turning that, you know, methodology to the, you know, to the pineal gland pretty soon. Well, maybe we'll have you back on and and you can talk about that uh, when y'all are done with it, because that sounds really interesting. Um, How does DMT... um Affect does does DMT affect serotonin or melatonin function? Uh, let's say you you use DMT, will it affect your serotonin or melatonin production? Um, well, DMT stimulates specific you know kinds of you know receptors for serotonin in the brain. Um, I think people have looked at you know serotonin levels in response to DMT and. You know, in uh, in you know non-human animals, but I can't really remember what the impact was. You know, serotonin is an abundant you know you know neurotransmitter. So I've you know mostly you know been interested in in the receptors you know for serotonin you know that DMT attaches to. You know, so that's kind of how you know DMT works is through modifying you know the metabolic activity of you know certain receptors for serotonin. 
Um, did you ever perform an fMRI? 